It is a distinct pleasure to be with you, to have the opportunity to again participate in this lectureship. It's always a pleasure to come home to Pensacola and to Bellevue. You are home. And uh, the membership here, the leadership, everyone is very precious to me and my family. We greatly appreciate your stand for the truth, your love for Christ, for souls, and the fact that you have stood so firmly for the truth uh, so many years, from the very outset of the start of this congregation. That was its dedication, and it has not swerved from that. The early elders that you had uh, held to the truth, and the men that you have had in that position down through the years, have uh, done likewise, the elderships that have been in place, and the one you have right now is still holding to that uh, quite firmly. We love and appreciate Brother Paul and Michael uh, so much and their families. One of the most fascinating figures in the Bible is, of course, the prophet Jonah, the son of Amittai, he was a prophet of God in the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century B.C. during the reign of Jeroboam the son of Joash, or Jehoash, often called Jeroboam the second, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. The time period was one of general prosperity for Israel due possibly in part to the influence of Jonah, especially the influence he exerted in the king's court. He advised Jeroboam II in his campaign against their northern enemy of Syria, then under the leadership of Ben-Hadad. Sin, however, was still rampant in Israel, especially because of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, continuing abomination in the worship of the golden calves. This would be Jeroboam I, going back to the time of the division of the United Kingdom into the divided period uh, where you had the northern tribes uh, comprised Israel and the southern tribes comprised Judah. At any event, uh, the introduction of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel had had a long history of uh, evil influence upon the nation, upon the northern kingdom. And uh, in fact, Jeroboam I, on a number of occasions, is referred to as the man who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Well, that was still true at the time of Jeroboam II and at the time that uh, Jonah lived. Jonah is most remembered for being swallowed by a great fish before he would finally submit to carrying out his mission to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh in order to announce to that city the God's overthrow. His message that the city would fall in 40 days had an effect that produced repentance from the king of Assyria down to the lowest of her people, much to the prophet's personal dismay. I would to God this day that we would have leadership in our own nation that would show the same intelligence that the king of Assyria uh, demonstrated on the occasion of Jonah's preaching. Amen. That we would have individuals in our Congress and in our presidency and in our courts who would humble themselves and submit to the authority of Almighty God. Jonah was a Hebrew patriot who earnestly desired the destruction of Nineveh rather than the city's inhabitants being spared through God's forbearance and mercy. But his life is remarkable in other ways associated with these events. He, as with a number of Old Testament characters, was a type, a tupas, of Christ. A type was a shadow of the real thing or person called the antitupas. A type could be virtually anything, a person, a thing, or even an event. It foreshadowed and forespoke by its existence and peculiar nature 
of something or someone who was yet to come and to accomplish something that was similar and yet superior to that accomplished by or in the type. Jonah holds such a relationship and divine revelation to Jesus Christ. There are three basic typological connections between the two that we wish to look at this morning. First of all, Jonah was a type of Christ as a prophet of God. Jonah, as with all the prophets of God in the Old Testament, foreshadowed the coming of the ultimate prophet, the one who in the highest sense was the true prophet, for even the Old Testament prophet spoke by means of his spirit. 1 Peter 1, verse 11. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus Christ had a role in prophesying of himself through the work of the Old Testament prophets and then fulfilled those same prophecies. Totally unlike any other religious leader or figure in the history of the world. One of the things that sets him apart, besides the fact that uh, they died and are still dead, and he died and rose from the dead and ever lives to make intercession for us. The prophetic office in ancient Israel was not only given to reveal God's word to the nation, but to point to the coming of Jesus Christ, God's spokesman for this age, Hebrews 1 verse 1. The specific nature of the work of the prophet is captured in the Hebrew word navai, most often used with this idea. The term basically means a spokesman. In fact, it is used in that way in Exodus 7.1, where Moses is told that uh, you're to take Aaron with you and he will be your navai, your prophet. He'll be your spokesman. After Moses had been making excuse, excuse me, he was making excuse as to uh, uh, why he should not go and uh, speak to Pharaoh. That he, he claimed that he was not eloquent. And uh, God reminded him, even though in Acts 7 we read that he was a man mighty in word and deed. God reminded him on this occasion that you have a brother, Aaron, he can speak for you. Well, he would be Moses' spokesman. This same basic idea is carried by the Greek word prophetes, from whence we have the word prophet itself. While these terms had their more sec uh, secular uses, in the scriptures they take on an application to a special class of God's servants in ancient times. The word hoe was also used occasionally to describe a prophet as a seer. This alluded to the ability of his, uh, to foresee future events, and especially uh, through the avenue of visions and dreams. The principal function of a prophet of God was to be a spokesman for God, to be his mouthpiece, if you please. As in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where God told Jeremiah, I will put my words in your mouth. Numerous times in Jeremiah and Isaiah and other uh, books of prophecy, a remark is made concerning by God concerning uh, hearing the words of his mouth, which is an allusion to the work of the prophet. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, certain individuals are condemned because they go down to Egypt contrary to the mouth of the Lord. That is, they violated the teaching of the prophet uh, relative to going down to Egypt for help. God placed his words in the mouth of the prophet by inspiration. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The word of God was breathed out. Theopneustos. It was not breathed into. was not an in-breathing. It was an out-breathing. Coming from the very mind of God but selected from the mind as far as the vocabulary and things of that nature. And the style selected from the mind of the individual prophet or prophets that were used to reveal it. These men were holy men of God. 
that expression itself implies that they had been prepared in some, in some way to this particular service by God's providential care. They were holy men of God who spoke by the impulsion and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They were born along, Peter says, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, by the Holy Spirit. The wording there draws a picture of someone picking the other up and bearing him along, carrying him along in the course of what he's saying and what he is doing. And that's what the Holy Spirit did in relationship to the work of the prophets. The prophetic gift was, then, was what uniquely qualified one then to serve as a prophet of God or even as a prophetess, even though the work and authority of the latter was, were more limited. This gift entailed key aspects of the prophetic office. For one, the prophet served as an inspired preacher. This is sometimes described as being a forth teller, referring to the telling forth of God's word on everyday matters. The prophet, for a second thing, also served as a foreteller. He could foresee and thus speak of future events, sometimes of things relatively close at hand, but also just as often things uh, or events far distant from his own day, and even at times of multiple events in the same discourse. Brother Rex Turner used to describe the prophecies in this fashion. He said many times the prophets, the prophets foresaw and spoke of events as one would describe a mountain range, seeing only the mountain peaks but not the valleys in between. And so many times you can have a prophecy that is dealing with the Babylonian captivity and yet the prophet looks beyond that and sees the gospel age in the same prophecy. Sees the gospel, time, the, the gospel dispensation and the events associated with it. And even look beyond that and say something relative to the end of the world, that is uh, the physical universe and so on that uh, such often occurred with the work of the prophets in seeing multiple events. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 through 17, Moses declared to Israel that God would raise up a prophet like unto himself from among the people. And he said, Him ye shall hear in all things, and whosoever will not listen or hear that prophet will be destroyed from among the people. Acts chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, specifically cites that prophecy and applies that to Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate fulfillment of that text. Moses stated that God said that uh, they, that is the Jews, have well spoken that which they have spoken. Deuteronomy 18, verse 17. That is, that we will not hear his voice anymore uh, as far as him speaking to us. They were terrified at the uh, voice of God coming down from Mount Sinai. And so in place of hearing the literal voice of God, as it were, he sent his spokesman in his place, and ultimately, Jesus the Christ. Jesus then is that great prophet like unto Moses whom the people were to hear in all things. Matthew chapter 17 verse 5. Tremendous text that shows the superiority of Christ over that of the law of Moses and that of the prophets. That uh, his authority supersedes uh, their authority. But the text of Deuteronomy 18 also anticipated the establishment of the prophetic office in ancient Israel. And in so doing, the typological relationship between the Hebrew prophets and Jesus Christ. Moses gives the test for a true faithful prophet of God in Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 through 22. For one, the prophet had to prophesy in the name or by the authority of Jehovah God. If he prophesied by the name of another God, then he was a false prophet. 
He also had to uh, prophesy of what would indeed come true. If what he said did not come to pass, when he said it would come to pass, then he was a false prophet. They were not to be afraid of him, but rather they were to take him out and stone him, put him to death. Thus Moses turns his attention from the great prophet like unto himself to those who would serve in the prophetic office in ancient Israel until that prophet would come. Jonah, as part of the long line of prophets of God under the former economy, served by his very person and work to remind ancient Israel of the coming of the one uh, about whose special status Moses had just spoken. For a second thing, Jonah was also a type of Christ as concerned his preaching. Now clearly this is in association with his work as a prophet of God. And while this flows from that relationship that existed between Jonah and Jesus relative to the prophetic office, it is of special mention here due to the Lord's own comparison between the two regarding the preaching of God's word. Jonah was charged with preaching the preaching that God bid him to preach. Jonah 3, verse 3. Though he was unwilling when first commissioned to go to Nineveh, and though he was still unhappy with the task due to his understanding of God's merciful nature even later, Jonah carried out his mission to Nineveh. As one uh, brother Nichol said one time, it took a little bit of a whaling to get him to do it, but <laughs> he finally did uh, comply. Jesus Christ contrastingly carried out his mission to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10, with a humble and obedient heart from the start. He came to do the will of him who sent him, that is the heavenly Father. And he never uh, de uh, detoured from that uh, course. He never even attempted to do so. Both indeed proclaim the word of God. Yet there is a contrast, a dissimilarity as to the attitude behind and their, their intent behind the message itself. In the case of, of Jonah, he went and did it, but he didn't want to. Brother Turner often referred to him as the unwilling foreign missionary. He had to go. He's also sometimes described as the running prophet. And you take the four chapters and basically you have him running from God in chapter 1, running back to God in chapter 2, running with God in chapter 3 when he goes to Nineveh and preaches, and then he's running ahead of God in chapter 4. And uh, still he's not satisfied with the outcome because the Ninevites are forgiven and are spared because of their repentance. That doesn't please him. Jesus himself made the comparison between them. He said, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Question, how do they do that unless there's a resurrection from the dead? I know they kind of, I, I know that Bayesden and that bunch will try to spiritualize it, figureize it. It's amazing. You know, the, the premillennialists literalize everything. This bunch figureize everything. You don't have, and, and if it doesn't fit when they figureize it, then it's, oh, then it's literal. And by the way, brethren, do you know what passage they use to justify their spiritualization of text? It's been dealt with in this program, been discussed. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. A passage that deals with miraculous inspiration and revelation. They apply it to themselves and they say that they have the authority then to spiritualize. That that's, that's what Paul's talking about. You're supposed to interpret everything spiritually. You talk about demonstrating an abject ignorance of the Bible. That is a misuse of that text. And it has nothing to do 
with uh, the matter of hermeneutics on that end of things. That's totally an invented farce. But that's where they come from. Anyway, they'll condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 12, verse 41. Often the distinctions between the type and the anti-type are as significant as the similarities. In this case, Jesus is the superior of Jonah thus making the refusal to obey the Lord's preaching by the Jews of his generation even more heinous. Even the hardened and bitter men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, which more literally should be rendered, rendered into the preaching of Jonah. That is, in order to receive the blessing of forgiveness implicit within it. Jonah came reluctantly to the men of Nineveh, bringing a message that spoke principally of doom. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There is no explicit statement of hope in that statement, or in that proclamation. And yet he understood that even making that, because of the nature of Jehovah God, there was the possibility of forgiveness if they would repent and that's what he why he was upset and yet they did repent Jesus came willingly to those of his generation speaking a message of both forgiveness and coming judgment and yet they would not repent you know one of the things we need to learn as gospel preachers not everyone's going to obey the truth, number one. And number two, even if you did everything absolutely perfectly, not everyone's going to obey the truth. The, the one who was the only perfect one, they killed. They murdered him. And so if you're doing your job, and making certain that you're doing it in the right attitude, in the right away and yet brethren hate you or people despise you or people reject you they're not rejecting you they are rejecting God that's the bottom line that's the lesson of 1 Samuel 8 too that's the first Sam the Samuel had to learn that lesson and I know uh, with young preachers starting out you get into a situation and, and uh, you think you're doing a great job, things seem to be going well, and suddenly you're pulled into a meeting and some old cantankerous so-and-so decides to jump down your throat right at the start because you happen to step on his favorite hobby and step all over. You didn't even know it. And then you think, what did I do, what did I do wrong? And you sit there and search and try. You go through that. Older preachers do as well from time to time. Brother George Darling used to say this, if you haven't been fired at least one time, you're not worth your salt. <laughs> Brother, jo Brother George, well, on one occasion this lectureship, they asked, uh, how many preachers been fired? He was sitting down front and he, Ira said, George, you've been fired several times. <laughs> George said, I've been transferred. <laughs> That was his response. You're going to have that. For a third thing, Jonah was a type of Christ regarding their personal plights. Jonah's attempt to flee from Jehovah by means of a ship of Tarshish, which referred to a relatively large ship that was then capable of ocean travel from the Phoenician colony of Tartessus on the coast of Spain, ended with Jonah being cast overboard into the mouth of a great fish prepared by God. Someone says, well, Brother Den, do you believe that fish tale? Most certainly. As with Brother Keeble, if it said that Jonah swallowed the fish, I'd believe that too. If you can prove the Bible is the word of God, if you can demonstrate the certainty of it, then you can demonstrate that whatever it teaches must be the truth, and God can get the job done. 
just like dealing with some of these folks, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, who run around and say, oh, God can't burn up the universe. And by the way, some of these AD 70 people saying the same thing. So how in the world can God burn up the universe and uh, just consume everything else? Read 1 Kings 18. You had fire come, came down out of heaven. It consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the wood. consumed the altar. And it, and it licked up the water in the ditch. Now, who sent the fire? If God says he can do it, he can do it. And by the same token, to those who believe, and I know they're out there, who believe that God will not or cannot punish a man in fire, in hell, and yet not consume him, go study Exodus 3 and 4 concerning the burning bush. You had a bush that was on fire and yet was not consumed. The silliness of unbelief that we see among people who profess to believe in God. Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, crying out, that is Jonah, crying out day and night for deliverance from his predicament. Amazingly, Jonah was obviously preserved by the power of God from being digested. After the three days and three nights, he was vomited out upon dry land by God's grace. As uh, Brother Jess Whitlock commented just before I got up to speak, he said, you know what the, the uh, message of Jonah is? The, he said, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> I like that. And then finally, he set about to carry out his reluctant mission trip to Nineveh. When questioned uh, repeatedly for a sign by the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees as proof of his deity, Jesus responded thusly, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign will be given it save the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, and I don't care whether you translate that fish or whale, God can get it done whether it's one or the other. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12, 40. With these words, the Lord then announces the, time, the length of time in which his body would be in the borrowed tomb upon his death. He also implicitly declared that he would rise from the dead. It was then both a prophecy and a challenge to uh, those hard-hearted Jews. His fulfillment of the prophecy by his resurrection would be more than sufficient proof of his deity. Paul wrote later that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1 verse 4. It was the exclamation point, the exclamation point of the Father upon the deity of His Son, Jesus the Christ. Raised from the dead! The exact time frame of three days and three nights would serve as a marker in history of the resurrection. Jesus thus prophesied of the precise moment in time in which he would rise from the dead. But to be buried for so long required the preservation of his body. It would have demanded that, just as the uh, body of uh, Jonah had to have been preserved. Further, like Jonah, he would also experience some measure of sorrow and mental anguish. But unlike the rebellious prophet, the suffering was not due to his own sins. The words then anticipate the Lord's time of sorrow and suffering for the sins of the world. He would have to walk a dark valley that tread all the way to Calvary. The heartache and anguish associated with his crucifixion 
would precede his time in the tomb. Yet he did not perish. Though his body was in the tomb, we are, are told that his spirit, his soul, was not left uh, in Hades. That uh, yet his, his spirit had been in the Hadean realm in Abraham's bosom. And uh, when raised from the dead, it was not left in Hades but was rejoined to his body at the resurrection. With all those who had been faithful to God under patriarchy and the Mosaic system, he was there in Abraham's bosom. You, have you ever thought about, you know, in trying to picture these things? Now I think if we, if we would deal with the text, keep in mind, we're dealing with genuine, real, historic events. These aren't fairy tales. These aren't myths. Despite the fact we got folks who are now trying to say Genesis chapters 1 through 12 are just a bunch of myths. And some of them up in Michigan. These are not fairy tales. Adam and Eve were real people. Abraham was a real person. Jerry knew him. Real, genuine. Jesus' spirit was literally in Abraham's bosom. That place called Abraham's bosom in the Hadean realm. Now stop and think. <coughs> Here are all of those Old Testament prophets who died in faith. Here are all those Old Testament patriarchs. Here, who died in faith. There's King David, who died in faith. There are all those godly women like Hannah, who died in faith. And now in their very midst is the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And they're able to converse with him, to talk with him, to see him. To be reaffirmed of the certainty of what they, have, what they stood for and did in their own lives. Brother Terry was talking about the emotional aspect of things. If that doesn't move you, I don't know what would. That's what we're here for. That's what this is all ultimately about. For us to be able to go and be with the Lord in eternity. And any doctrine that calls that into question. Or raises any doubt concerning that wonderful opportunity of reunion. Of being with the Lord. Of being together with the righteous of all the ages is an obnoxious and odious doctrine. Brethren, it must have been a joyous occasion when the Lord's Spirit was carried into the Hadean realm and He was there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and David and all of those great Old Testament noteworthy. It had to have been a joyous occasion. What they had gone through, the sufferings, the hardness, the hardships, the heartbreak that they had endured. Now here he is. Everything they had looked for. And it had to give even further assurance that there is going to be that time when in heaven, not only they, but it, those of the saints of all the ages, will be gathered around the great throne of God with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and with the angels singing the praises of God throughout the ages. That has to have some effect on us. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm looking forward to. Not some pie in the sky here on the earth. 
If this is all there is and it gets no better than this, then I go a fishing. But God be thanked, that's not the way it is. Jesus rose from the dead. His body was preserved. And as a result, was joined again to his spirit, his soul. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests would be powerless to stop it and were. Not even the might of the Roman army and the special military guard set by permission of Pontius Pilate at the request of the Sanhedrin could prevent it. He arose! He got up from the dead. As was told to the women, he is not here for he is risen. What stirring words it had to have been for them to hear. Matthew 28, verse 6. The resurrection from the dead. And he is the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and following. His own resurrection is assurance of our coming resurrection. Without a doubt. Indeed. Jonah was a type of Christ in so many wonderful ways. And there are probably other ways that you can think of. The Son of God prefigured through the actions of a man who was flawed in so many ways, but nonetheless was a great prophet of God. Gives hope for us. Thank you. That is a, such an important aspect that without the resurrection, there is nothing. Uh, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and that's it. Get the most while you can because there's nothing else if there's no resurrection. And yet, the very debate that he'll be engaging in in September, those individuals deny a future resurrection. In effect, this is all that there is. Uh, when I would get into discussion with them, one of the first things that I would ever ask is, am I in heaven or hell right now, and which one are you in? Because this is it. Uh, if their doctrine is true, and there is nothing future, but uh, thanks be to God, there is.